Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for taking time and attending this powerful presentation by two of our great leaders in New York State um, working uh, every day on improving the lives of individuals that receive services throughout the state of New York and improving the lives of providers to have a uh, a, a more effective and productive way in doing the work that they do. So thank you. This is Nyapras, and we're part of the uh, Cultural Competency Committee webinar series. This will be the first one out of four. Um, we're very excited that we're starting with um, this particular topic, and um, our presenters today will be Lenora Reed Rose. She's the director oh. of the Cultural Competence and Health Literacy at Coordinated Care Services Incorporated, and Harvey Rosenthal, the CEO of NIAPRAS. Um, quick announcement um, for those of you who are interested in joining the Cultural Competency Committee, our next meeting will be facilitated November 27th. That will be next week, November 27th at 1 p.m. Please, um, if you do have time next week, join us and become part of this very dynamic committee. Also, for those of you who are here and are looking for CEUs, this will provide a CEU unit uh, and you will get it when you complete the evaluation at the end of today's presentation. So, uh, thank you again, and I'm going to pass it now to our two phenomenal presenters, Lenora Reed Rose and Harvey Rosenthal. And um, thank you, Lewis. And um, Harvey and I are just delighted to be um, offering this conversation with those who have joined us um, today. Harvey, is there anything you'd like to say? No, I'm uh, w welcome everybody, and thank you, Lewis, for your work on the committee and all the committee members. And uh, I'm thrilled to be presenting with my old friend Lenora. So, I uh, I hope our presentation is helpful, and I hope, if possible, we'll have some time for some sort of uh, back and forth. Uh, okay. Take it so away, we have a lot of slides, and um, we'll start with the we're hoping that we can go through them very quickly. There may be an opportunity to get the slides um, later on, but we're going to go through as quickly as we possibly can, and hopefully we'll get towards the end. We do not want to leave you hanging with some of the information we have prepared for you. So um, this first slide speaks to looking on cultural competence and cultural humility. It's one of those things, those two frames that we keep tossing around to and from. Some of the latest um, conversation um, I've heard, and that drove me to kind of put the slide together, is that some folks are looking at cultural humility as an alternative to cultural competence. I'm sure most of the folks on the call um, know the main plain definition of what cultural competence is and what cultural humility is. So we will not go through that right now. I just want to side by side to draw your attention to the attributes of both cultural competence and cultural humility. And when you look on the slide, you see there's a lot of crossovers. There, um, the, the big um, emphasis on cultural humility is the process, and it speaks more to engaging and engaging over a lifetime. Also, thinking of the other individual and how do you engage that individual and in services. With cultural competence, sometimes it's seen as an engine of itself, which definitely is not. It's a developmental process, but it also speaks a lot to um, the product and what, what would you want to do in terms of health literacy, healthcare disparities, and um, items like that. So one thing that we're going to put forth in our presentation today, instead of completing the con replacing the concept, of cultural competence with cultural humility, let's, let's 
let's have them both in the same pot working together. Because cultural humility speaks more to the process and cultural competence speaks more to the product. So they should work side by side instead of opposite, opposition um, to each other. Hey, Lenora, I just want to jump in. I just want to jump in and say that all these slides will, will be on the website at some point. So don't worry if you don't get it all. Go ahead. Sorry, Lenora. Yeah, sorry. That's okay. Um, however, today we will be focusing, as was described in the advertisement for this, on health disparities, social determinants, and how it influences the most important factors of New York policies and affect those who are most vulnerable in our, um, in our community of New York. One of the things we want to start with is let's get on the same page as to what is health. Health starts in our homes, our schools, our workplaces, neighborhoods, and communities. We know that taking care of ourselves by eating well and staying alive, not smoking, getting the recommended um, immunizations and screening tests, Etc. all contributes and all influences our health. Our health is also determined, it is art, by access to social and economic opportunities, the resources and supports available in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and in our communities. So for us to be um, truly um, well, we need to take all those things into consideration. The WHO defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of a disease. And that's very important because very often we talk about health as a diagnosis. And what we're going to pass, we're going to lead you on today, is to share with you that it is not just that; it is more than that. So, what creates what creates health? It's a multifactorial and it's complex. It includes education, it includes, it includes employment, it includes, um, we have to look on poverty, it includes um, our eating habits. Then we have to take it out of physical health and then connect it to behavioral, the behavioral health factors that does guide how we behave, our mental health um, status or um, substance use, all those together with all these other social behaviors and issues do contribute to our, our well-being. Wellness, on the other hand, extends beyond the traditional health confines of well-being to incorporate the intersectionality of behavioral, physical, and social. And I mean, one of the things that we want to put out there as well is that we probably be talking about well-being and not necessarily just um, just health. Global Wellness Institute, um, we got the slide um, from them, where it's looking on what the medical paradigm is and what the wellness paradigm is. And you can see that on the left-hand side where we have the medical paradigm, it says we feel better over wellness, we thrive to be. We treat and cure illnesses. Over in wellness, we maintain and improve health. Um, for wellness, we think of it as preventative and not just correcting. And we're looking on a holistic approach, looking on individuals, and looking on how that connects with life and um, and what we life and our well-being and our well-being and happiness. So this next slide, it speaks to looking on both wellness, well-being, and happiness. And I am going to skip the slide uh, because we have, we'll keep repeating most of the essence on the slide throughout the presentation to give us some more time to address the other slides. Health equity is very important when we begin to look on health disparities. It means efforts to ensure that all people have full and equal access to opportunities that enable them to lead healthy lives. Everyone must have a fair opportunity to live a long and healthy, healthy life. And this, this slide is, um, it, it, it gives us a clear um, distinction between equality and equity, because very often when we think of how we think of 
um, folks must we must have equal equal stuff. So if you get a loaf of bread, Lenore needs a loaf of bread. The next person needs a loaf of bread, and it's not necessarily so. I may not need more than a half a loaf, and that's what gets the gets the equity. So what's the reality? If you look on the box, it speaks the reality. What's the reality? You know, one person you get like how many loaves there, and person the green short gets only one and the person in the purple thing gets zero. So you see the disparities in the um happening there. So let's be equal. So if we have we're going with equality, everyone gets one box to stand on. What do you see happening there? Um one person can clearly see over the fence. The other person's chin is probably going to be knocked off to um to look over the fence, and the poor fellow, Lenore in the purple shirt, can't even get to the top of the fence. So we said, okay, so on equity, we're looking on Lenore in the purple um, shirt will probably need two boxes. The um, person in the green shorts will need only one box, and our person here in the blue shirt at this moment in time does not need a box because so now we're all we are all able to see over the fence and watch the beautiful game that's going on. So liberation, let's tear the fence down. Let's remove the fence. We don't want any walls. So everyone can see within um over the fence and clearly enjoy the game. Then we go to inclusion. Inclusion say, okay, let's come in and you can you can play the game if you want to. This is a very powerful slide and in our work. When we're dealing with consumers and dealing with our staff, we need to be very cognizant on what are the needs of each individual. It doesn't necessarily mean that because Corey gets a loaf of bread, Lenora should get a loaf. Lenora may just need half a loaf, and then definitely there will be more to go around. What are the disparities? The disparities, differences in health outcomes that are closely linked with social, economic, and environmental disadvantages and are often driven by social conditions in which individuals live, learn, work, and play. That's the most current World Health Organization um, definition. Racial health disparities. When we look on disparities, we know that most individuals who are not of European descent do have a disadvantage. So one of the things that we talk about data and looking looking through those lenses, we need to overlay um, the demographic variables to, and to see what those differences are and then what we need to focus on. But you have multi multiple factors, and the more we go into social determinants of health, you'll get to see that. There are multiple factors that do um, contribute to the racial ethnic disparity of, um, of those we serve. And this is a famous cult, most of you probably do know it from Martin Luther King, who speaks to of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. That's powerful. If we look on back to some of those social factors that we talk about, we have the socioeconomic factors, which we can um, put under that umbrella, education, job status, family support, income, community safety. We have physical environment, we have health behaviors, and we have healthcare access to, um, to care and quality of care. If you look on the diagram, what jumps out is for us really to be healthy and to be well, only 20%, and I've seen that percentage kind of hover between 20, the most I've seen is 40%, but I'd say, about 20% of our well-being happens in this healthcare sector. All so we have 20 from 100, 80% of our well-being comes from socioeconomic, physical, and other health um, behaviors. So for us to be really healthy and for us to be well, we really need to pay attention to all those other factors outside of that healthcare that encounter environment that contributes so much to our to our health, to our well being. So wellness and well being cannot be achieved without addressing social determinants.
And what are social determinants of health? They are the conditions in the environment in which people are born, in which they live, in which they learn, in which they work, in which they play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risk. And um, if we look on this, what we have done, we have captured some of the key elements of social determinants of health in this um, in this picture, and we have identified some of the factors in each, we call them buckets. So our next slide kind of breaks out those buckets. So in the, there are individual factors that would contribute to the health and well-being of an individual, and those factors are race, age, gender, culture, self-efficacy, exercise, addition, coping, and diet. Those are just some of it. There are many others that we can lump in this bucket. Social network, social hierarchy, exclusion relationships, family dynamics, the media, if you look on public services and infrastructure, you guys think of economic development, transportation, health and access to health care, living and working conditions, working environment, job availability, wages, the list goes on, social, economic, and political factors. You think of incarceration, discrimination, communication, political participation, racism, stigma, poverty, and we come to health factors which only contribute 20%. If you think of that previous slide, it only contributes 20% of someone's well-being. So the healthcare system, health coverage, provider availability, provider linguistic and cultural competence, and quality of care. So 80%, and that's a huge range, 80% of our well-being comes from somewhere else, from us interacting with or individuals assess, assisting us to engage meaningfully with all these other, other buckets. So if we look at education and employment, fewer Blacks, that's in one of the buckets, fewer Blacks graduate from high school, say 32.5%, than do Hispanic whites, 87.2, and more whites than blacks earn a bachelor's degree. As of February 2016, unemployment rates were twice as high for blacks than for whites. When we think of education in particular, and I, I have a, a education is very dear, very, very dear to, um, to my heart. It is clear when you look on some of the research and the data out there that most individuals at or below a fourth grade level, there's a direct correlation to their health outcomes. So if we're not, if I'm operating at a third or second grade level or even a fourth grade level, and I can't interact with my, with my, um, my caregivers, or they don't acknowledge at that, that I'm at that level and spend additional time to interact with me, then I'm gonna be nodding my head Acting as if I'm a, I know what they're talking about, I leave their place and I go back to where I live, work, play, and worship, and don't do what it says. So there's a direct correlation. If people aren't employed, they will not be able to access the health services or have money, have poverty. Employment so much impinges on employment. Poverty, you have that to the correlation to, and those are incarcerated. They all link together. So as caregivers we, and um, funders of services, we cannot just put health care, how we define health care, in a bucket, tie it up, and just say one thing we normally um, focus on is access. Like as long as people have access, things will be well. Well, we're going to say to you today, today that that's not the only thing. There are many, many other things that we need to find a way to bridge the gap so that folks can truly have be well and have um, positive outcomes. There's poverty. You know, African Americans are the poorest ethnic group in the United States. This is poverty is correlated with poor health outcomes, increased morbidity and mortality, heart diseases, diabetes, obesity, and it goes on and on and on. So when we go to see, when we connect with the healthcare, what we call the healthcare system, our caregivers need to be clear as to where we are as um, patients or as consumers 
on that poverty scale. Because if they are not, then they will not be taking that into consideration and all their good work will just fall on barren ground. Housing. Housing is another huge, um, huge, huge um, determinant. Um, if, if, you know, sometimes we joke about, you go to the doctor, they say, when you go home, um, take, you know, one tablet three times a day, take it with meals, you need nice cold water or whatever it is. If those things don't exist, it's very hard to follow up. But if I'm homeless or I'm looking at house, I'm on somebody's sofa, then very probably when I'm at the doctor, I'm not going to be thinking of, you know, what they're saying. I'm going to be thinking when I go home, what happens? And um, at CCSI, we, um, we administer a program for, for youth. And, you know, recently, last year, we had a youth that was in our program, and he was just not connected. But when we dig deep, what we found out, he could say, Lenora, you know, what you're doing here is very great, but guess what? When I go home, I don't know where my mom is going to be. Because when I was leaving to come to your program, she was, a, she was being kicked out of her apartment. You know, if, if I did not know that, if I did not, if he did not share it with me, if I did engage with him to the level where he could share that with me, then I would be probably on the path saying that he's just not being responsive, he's not paying attention. We cannot negate those things because it does impact how um, we respond to services and our, our health and well-being. And food, food is huge. If you are um, going through some of our neighborhoods, uh, when we see what kind of stores are there, um, it's sometimes I, I work in neighborhoods or I go through neighborhoods where um, it's the corner store, come the corner store. There's a food dessert. So what you see sometimes, very often it could be stale food. There, there are no vegetables. There are uh, all pre-prepared food. So you know, as an individual, I'm diabetic, and if that's all I'm being exposed to, it's gonna be hard for me to eat well so I can um, I can reverse my diabetes or at least have, have it not impacting um, the way I, I, I operate on a daily basis. Location is huge, and, and lots of this, this is, um, we're very deliberate with this picture where we have needles, all sorts of different kind of needles in these bottles. So depending on where we live, then um, our location will have a great impact on the outcomes of our health. Some of the research, and it's very clear some work that we've done when you look on some areas, in a, like within a two mile radius, you'll have someone living at point A and someone living two miles from point A, and the person who lives in point, in point B the two miles away will have a very, very different health outcome because place does matter and place has um, impacts when you look on social terms of health. It so is where you live really does impact those determinants and um, what you get, what you see. Now, this, this for me is just one of those slides that I, I love and I must give a shout out to Nancy Shelton. And Nancy is my staff, and she put all these these wonderful pictures together. I'm not a picture person, but Nancy, I can rely on Nancy do a very good job in connecting the dots for us through pictures. And you know, this person who is like a doctor is just looking right through the person. And do you how often do you feel that you are at a place going for healthcare or going for services and the person is looking right through you? They don't see you. They don't acknowledge who you are. They don't acknowledge all the things that impact you, impact um, how you live, where you are, and you leave with a diagnosis or you leave with treatment that is really not about you because the individual who was actually caring or supposed to care for you looked right through you instead. So Harvey's now going to pick up the piece of our presentation. Harvey. Thank you, Lenora. I just got to make sure that I've got been given control of the slides. Yes. Lady Corey <laughs> is helping me now. Do you have? Yes. 
How are you? There I go. There we Perfect. go. Well, wait a minute. I don't see it on yet. I see your screen. But I don't see them there. Should we try it again? Oh. It says so you screen. have enter. Yeah, I don't um, see it. Do you see it? Do you see my slides there? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you do? Well, I we don't. Top. Oh, okay. This is what we want. Got it. There you go. <clears throat> I'm slick. I'm Mr. Slick over here with technology. Uh, so I got to go to slide 27. Bear with me. Welcome, everybody. And Lenora, thank you so much. I just want to say while I'm fussing around here that cultural competence, cultural humility, overcoming health disparities is central, become a central theme for NIAPRIS for some years. Uh, and it's a big issue around services, systems, and social justice. Um, if you just go to our, it's wired into our events. If you go to conference, we have a multicultural exhibit, a, a conference track, a fashion show, a diversity bash. Our keynote speaker this year was Lewis. Uh, we had a racism conference a year or so ago that Lenore Needy put together. If you go to our lobby day, we are get heavily into issues that are relative to disparities and, in, and and most specifically on criminal justice, which I'll talk about now. So this is a year-round year -round issue for us. Criminal justice is really at the heart for me. It's the thing that gets me up in the morning. It's where I really bleed. It's the outrage that we, you know, that we live with if you do this work and you're out for social justice. There is no more heinous and horrific space of racism and system failure than the overpopulation of people of color, particularly African American, in the criminal justice system. And from top to bottom, the arrests, the shootings, you know, the solitary confinement, uh, the poor sort of release planning, uh, up and down the ladder, uh, people of color, particularly African Americans, are really feel that more than anybody. And the statistics will show that. Let me see why I'm not changing slide. Here we go. Uh, so here's Every an example of the expand your screen. Can you see it now? Expand. You need to expand your screen. I'm seeing I... what's on it, but the screen is real small. Okay. I mine looks completely big. No? Okay. I don't know if anybody else can see it. If not, uh send me a text at five one eight. Five two seven oh five six four five two seven oh five six four. It so looks black good. men make up thirteen percent of the general population, um, but thirty five percent of those that are incarcerated. As you'll see, this country has more. I think incarcerates more people than any in the world, and African Americans are the most incarcerated in the United States. So this is a horror that is, you know, is an international horror. Um, so. Uh, black women make up 13% of the general population, but 44% of the incarcerated. Uh, the average incarceration rates, I found this really awful, pretty awful. One out of every three black men are incarcerated. One out of every six, uh, six Latino men. One out of 17 white men. One out of 111 white women. One out of 18 black women and one out of 45 Latino women. So is that not a, da a damnation? Um, police search four times more for people of color, Latino black men, uh, when they're driving and they find more contraband on the white uh, than on the white drivers. You know, I was at a conference that, that Lenora was. You, you turned me on, Lenora, to ACMA, and Arthur Evans got up and talked about driving while black. As uh, and I never heard that before, but you certainly see it showing up here. Uh, the violence, of course. You know, it really falls from that. You'll hear more about firearms too, but <clears throat> African Americans accounted for, again, 13% of the population, but were the victims of 50% of homicide by firearm. Firearm homicide was the leading cause of death for African American men, <clears throat> excuse me, males, and the third leading cause for, for Latino males in the uh, 15 to 34 age group. <clears throat> firearms were used in over 91% of homicides of African American males in that 15 to 34 range, and 81% of homicides of Latino males. And you 
see in the uh, the graphic, uh, the cycle. Uh, you know, you see it again and again. People are assaulted, treated in the emergency room, admitted to a surgical uh, unit, trans discharged into the street, wind up getting a weapon, self-medicating in that horrible cycle, and then maybe tries to retaliate and winds up either dead or in jail. This is a terrible topic, and the one we're dedicated to to address, but there's, there's no way to talk about it in a way that doesn't just really break your heart, uh, you know, again and again. Uh, the, the disparate of treatment of Black Americans and the African Americans in the criminal justice system, 22% Black people, okay, living in poverty, 2016 as opposed to 9% of white people. And poverty leads to all the things we talked about, poor diet, poor access, you know, poor resources to to to, to navigate uh, in your community. Um, all the things that so many people of, of privilege get, some, you know, a parent will help out. So get a job or lend you money or give you money or steer you here and there, this does not happen. In, in communities of, of, uh, of in many communities, <clears throat> a parental incarceration. One out of eight four children incarcerated. One out of nine black children. One out of fourteen. One out of fourteen of all children are incarcerated. Horrific. <laughs> the disparities in incarceration. Some of these may be uh, redundant, <clears throat> but in 2014, African Americans constituted 2.3 million. Oh, th or one. Essentially, one 34 percent of the total 6.8 million population. They are African Americans incarcerated more than five times the rates of white people, and the prison rate for African American women is twice that of, of white. Women. And you'll see the graphics on that. And again, we'll have these on the slide on the uh, website. <clears throat> uh, nationwide, African American children. I have a cold. I apologize. Uh, represent 32 percent of children who are arrested. 42% of children who are detained, 52% of children whose cases criminal court. Um, again, there's, there's no power here. I mean, it's just victimization up and down the ladder. Throughout, though African Americans and Hispanics make up approximately 32% of the U.S. population, 50%, 6% of incarcerated people. And if here's one, if African Americans and Hispanics were incarcerated at the same rate as whites, which means a lot less, the jail population, prison populations would decline by 40%. Think of the social justice, but the cost of saving and how those monies could be reinvested into community services and, and diversion services and reentry services. So, um, in 2005, there was a national survey on, let me get this thing out of the way here, on drug use and health. About 17 million whites and 4 million African Americans reported using, using an illicit drug. But the imprisonment for African Americans for drug charges is almost six times that of whites. Um, when you see issues like bail reform or, you know, uh, or decriminalization, for example, of marijuana, that will affect some, that will reduce the incarceration rate, particularly for people of color uh, in profound ways. African Americans, and, and again, the issue, as you well know, a white person who's using drugs often is set free, a black person will might be, you know, in an ungodly period of time in the system, the social criminal justice. African Americans represent 12.5% of the illicit drug users, 29% of those arrested, and 33% of those incarcerated. Back to what I was just saying. Let me figure this out. Okay. Uh, Lenore talked about employment, but here's another sort of link between incarceration and employment. When you, and this is true of all groups, uh, and we're trying to change that. For example, in the mental health community, hiring peers who have been in jails and prisons. Uh, so important, very hard to do. Uh, but in general, the criminal, a criminal record can reduce the callback for a job offer up to 50%, and that's twice as large for African Americans. This slide. With something Lenora sent over, and it's, I'm just going to leave it on the screen. There's so much to it. I, I'm still learning a couple of times this slide, but basically, it talks about the disparity in education, which is in the favor of white people, and the disparity in incarceration, which is, is oppressive to uh, African Americans. You'll see all of the uh, issues are 
thereof. This will be on the slideshow on the uh, website. Probably the number one issue for me right now is the work on the HALT bill. The main alternative to long-term solitary confinement, talk about that a little bit. Uh, black male prisoners make up 40% of the total pr prison population for 43 jurisdictions, but constituted 45% in restricted housing. Restricted housing is not just solitary confinement, but things called, things called keep lock, where you're not allowed out of your cell. You may not be in the box, but you're confined and isolated. 21% of inmates confinement were Latino. Uh, <clears throat> and overall, 20 in these jurisdictions, Latinos were, were, were overrepresented. Over and as a, an advocate against solitary confinement, if you didn't have mental health issues, before you got into the box, you certainly do, and the trauma thereof. Um, oh, so this cycle of damage, cost, the lives and money of this overuse of isolated confinement, often because of an imbalance of power and a lack of training uh, in the jails and prisons, at minimum that. 85% uh, of, here's the staffing issue. You know, they always say, you want the staff to as much as you know some significant numbers of staff to look like uh, and, and be like the people they're serving well not here 85 percent of the state's 30,000 strong staff in the correction facilities are white majority are people of color the prisoners 25 percent of the state's 56,000 prisoners are latino three percent are are latino 11 and a half percent of the staff is black although half of the inmates identify as that so if this is a huge issue, um, I'm gonna keep going, I'm mindful of the time. So this is my APRA's advocacy, I'll end with that. Um, the HALT bill, again, two main alternatives to long-term solitary and, and isolated confinement. Uh, my APRA's is a very active member of CAKE, which is the campaign again for alternatives to isolated uh, confinement. I have been an advocate, as some of you may know, for 25 years. I have been on a million campaigns. I've led a number of them. I have never seen a campaign like the KQ. These folks from New York City, where I am right now, uh, many of them African American, so dedicated, come up all the time. We can't, we can get a crowd to Albany once, or maybe twice. They're there all the time. It is so personal. And any compromise on the bill. Uh, mean that thousands of people will either die or suffer uh, in the box, in the box solitary confinement, which is a cell the size of an elevator with a small window, and where you get out only one hour a day. Uh, I just can't imagine it. Um, and but they talk about it, and that we've been through the whole campaign, um, and I'm just moved. I feel like an old same man in this campaign. These are vibrant people who never quit. Um, and we were part of, you know, we did uh, all kinds of stuff in the war room, which is near the governor's office. We tried to get arrested in the Senate chamber. We, you know, there was a hunger strike. Uh, and at the end of the day, the governor um, really stole it away from, from us. We had votes in both houses to pass this bill, but the governor didn't want it. And so he came up with some large numbers, a billion dollars. We're going to build new jails and prisons. Not true. We're talking about changing the kinds of the, of the uh, architecture, if you will, in the, in the buildings, not 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 building new ones. Um, and so, at the eleventh hour, the governor basically pressured or talked the two houses to have passed it into sort of deferring to him, not to a law. Well, the laws are accountable. You're relying on an executive sort of action. You don't know how that's going to go, and it's far less than what we wanted. There's a full ban on people with mental health conditions, pregnant women, children, seniors, you know, people with, with you know, a variety of people with disabilities, so humane. Some would say nobody should be in the box, but certainly the most vulnerable groups should not. So there'll be a, there'll, there'll be a lobby day. I really want to encourage people to come up to Albany on the 21st. Um, and we'll work with your agencies or, or maybe the coalition, see if we can get a bus or two. Uh, but they need a thousand people there. And we've, we've committed to a hundred. So help us, please. Um, you'll see emails from our e-news. Uh, you can see, you can join the e-news as a subscriber on the uh, homepage, niappers.org. Um, 
please do. On the February 4th, we're doing a mental health specific day. I, last year I organized it and we did a news conference. We had the chairs of the committees and uh, really powerful speakers. So mental health, you know, we're really, NAMP is representing the face of mental health in this and the way it should be, it should be. And then our lobby, and, and I think what you'll see is that the Cultural Competence Committee is really not doing a number, expanding into a number of areas, particularly in the political and social justice area, and particularly in this area, where members of the committee will be meeting with CAKE in New York City and me uh, to really sort of coordinate. And then our lobby day, our, our traditional lobby day is February 25th, it will be in the egg. Uh, we usually get five, 600, maybe more people, and you can bet that this will be one of our issues is passing the whole bill. While I have you, we'll also be working on workforce. We, we fear that there'll be large Medicaid cuts given the crisis. Uh, you know, we'll be working on housing, but you can bet that halt is going to be a key issue. Um, Lenore, is this yours? Um, no, let me see. Yes, I start here. Um, and talk about yeah. strategies for to address. I'm going to kick it oh, back you to you now that to me. you got to switch back to me. Now now that I'm so good at this, here it comes. <laughs> I need to click show my screen. That's what Corey says. So I think I have it now. Corey, yeah. okay. I have it now. Okay. So, you know, there are many strategies out there to address social determinants of health. But one of the key, it's a very complex, it's a, it's a very, it's very complex. And it can be very challenging because very often um, both an, an organization doesn't have the, the capacity to address both. Like if I don't have food, they don't have a food pantry, but they are offering me mental health care. So, you know, it makes it much more. But I think I know, not think, I know there are ways where we can clearly address it and make sure that our uh, population have great outcomes. One of the things I'd love to um, point out, however, in all this complexity, is we need to stop looking at people as their disease or their diagnosis. We, um, people are complex. They cannot be so easily summarized. Instead, we must take into account the whole person. This includes not only their condition, but also their environment. Social determinants of health are not illnesses with tested treatments like cancer, diabetes, and asthma. Social determinants of health are an untold number of circumstances surrounding people. The circumstances and how they are faced will vary from one person um, to another. So that said, the strategies that have to be very different so not one, not any one strategy is going to lead to all these um, to a great outcomes. And the strategy must be addressed from a funder perspective to an organizational perspective and also to an individual perspective. We're just going to share just a few with you. Um, so one thing that we thought of is to advance health equity so that we can achieve optimal health for all. So expand to understand about what creates health. And in our previous slide, we addressed some of that. Strengthen the community to create their own healthy future and promote well-being in all our policies, beginning with health, with health in it, every policy. So if we're talking about housing, let's insert whatever policy deals with housing. Let's integrate health and make health a part of that because we now know that housing does impact or health and our wellness. I did share supplement as their disease or diagnosis. Approach health equity as a goal. It's, I mean, we, let, let's, let's not um, think about um, equality. Let's begin to think of equity because God knows when you look on our outcomes, it doesn't matter if it's a prison, if it's a healthcare, if it's an education in New York State, and you can go on any one of those websites and they have some CAD reports where you can see the disparities. So let's start with equity. So at the end of providing whatever service we are providing, 
that's already built into place and we can help to address the disparities in those um, cares. Assess social determinants of health in all individuals that we serve. And a huge piece um, for, for us is we need to gather data. It's very hard to do what we're doing without having the data to support it and to drive change. Gather data on social needs. The questions we're asking, we need to begin to look on our intake forms. What are those questions that we're asking? What are we collecting in our electronic health records so that we can connect where people are with who they are and we can serve the whole person instead of serving just 20% of them. And um, some additional strategies um, that will help to reduce healthcare disparities, and these may not be strange for folks on the call, as all health providers should be required to obtain regular training and scratch the training and say regular professional development and ongoing refreshers. It, it is, this cannot be a one training thing. It has to be something we're very, very serious about. If you think about it, if we're going to implement an evidence-based practice or some major thing, it's not just going to one training. It's an entire process that we go through several trainings. We monitor, collect data again to monitor the outcome, and then we can do corrective action if, um, if things don't go in the direction we want um, to go into. Train young people of color in the health profession. It should be viewed as an urgent national objective requiring the rebuilding of minimum social development and community health programs of the past. And very often, I think it's not just training, we need to just begin to expose people to say, you know, here's a field that you can go to get folks interested in so that they can bring their experience on who they are um, to the table. Raise public and provide awareness of racial ethnic disparities in care. Not just raise it, we need to mandate certain things. We cannot. You know, disparities in healthcare is costly. It is very costly. Look at our emergency rooms. Look at the healthcare costs in New York State. It is costly. We should not be providing the same service over and over again, get the same results, and keep provide the same service over and over again. Something needs to change. So disparities, they, it is very costly, and we can do something about that by not just raising awareness, but having certain mandates in place for our providers and um, for those who connect with our, our clients. Expand health insurance coverage, improve capacity, number of providers in underserved communities, increase the knowledge base on causes and interventions on disparities. Um, Hardy, I am now going to switch over to you. And while I'm switching over to Harvey, um, I just want to point out to you guys that um, Coordinated Care Services, Inc. and MACTAC, we are currently working on a brief, several briefs that will address social determinants of health, and those briefs will become available um, towards the end of November. So we're currently working general overview and digging, giving a deeper dive as to what it is and how we can alleviate it and what some what are some of the data things that you need to put in place? And also, more importantly, how do you talk about it? Harvey, did you get your screen? You know, I want, I, I want to uh, just really refer to Ruth Salon Wagner, who's the director of our training collective, and I think the family is here. But Ruth and the collective, under by OMH, give free trainings in cultural competence, and they help staff the committee. So just be aware to contact us at NAAP or Ruth has a package of training on advanced and cultural topics to so take advantage of that. Thanks to the Office of My Home. Um, here are some of the, let me get rid of this right here. Oh yeah, I'm so good. Uh, the, the, these are the advocacy issues for NIAPRs that affect this area of cultural competence. We're asking, of course, the workforce is critical. And by the way, the workforce that we're trying to get increases for, we did some across human services fields largely women and heavily women of color. So it's it's a issue on both counts to get an increase for agencies. Um, we're looking to raise the contracting requirements for community behavioral health organizations and the health plans. 
this is a big deal for me. I've been really tussling with the state around the outcome measures in a value-based payment environment. Money drives health care in the sense that health plans do where the money is. And the money from the state's outcome measures right now are medical, as is the whole field. It's about getting people to the doctor or clinician in seven days and our medication. There are no recovery measures in value-based payment, and I'm working hard uh, to get the three that have been recommended by OMH that we heavily support, which is uh, stable housing, stable finances, and reduced time in the criminal justice system. Those would be the three outcomes that health plans would be held accountable for. They, in turn, would, would hold providers, and money would be the incentives or penalties for that. Uh, <clears throat> we're doing a lot to ask in our district district two comments, which you can find on the website, uh, to fund, uh, fund peer pro professionals and increase the workforce <clears throat> and retention through some sort of uh, tuition reimbursement. Uh, I work on this thing with the value-based payment group. I was the lead on a group that had to do with advocacy and engagement. And we're not only trying to give incentives to plans and providers, but patients. And so there are patient incentives, and we were able to get uh, them to work with a group of experts, culturally competent expert panel, hasn't been appointed yet, to my knowledge, that would uh, uh, indicate what our, 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 our culturally competent incentives. <clears throat> We're trying to get minority representation at all, all groups there. Uh, let me go back to this. We're going to be holding candidate forums in 2020. Uh, we probably won't get any presidential candidates there. We want to be in like many areas throughout the state, all of our regions. We have about eight regions, I think. Um, and we'll work with other mental health groups and maybe addiction groups and other healthcare groups to hold these forums and have candidates probably from Congress and the Senate, you know, state Senate and Assembly and such to come and answer questions around what are you doing? What's your uh, position uh, addressing disparities? Um, etc. So you see them up there. I'm mindful of the time. Um, this is Lenora's slide, but Lenora, well, don't don't you think we should kick it over to questions with the little time we have? Yes, we have four minutes left. I think that's a great idea. So somebody's got four minutes to give a one minute question. I don't have the chat box, so if somebody can read the question, is there an open chat box that people can look at? So as of so as of now, um, we don't have uh, any specific questions. Am I am I right, Eileen? That's correct. I don't, okay, I don't know if the chat box is open. I can't. Listen, of course, I'm not going to be. All right. Well, I guess uh, I guess we'll. If you want to conclude, if each of you want to take uh, uh, two minutes to conclude, I can. Yeah, I'll give my I'll give my slide my screen back for Lenore, who does have these last slides to give. But while, while I'm doing that again, look for those uh, legislative day opportunities. We've got to get people with mental health issues, and particularly African Americans, out of the criminal justice system, not arrested, not tortured. And you know, leaving hospital, we're working a lot, on, on we've been really supporting a waiver from the federal government to restart Medicaid 30 days before jail and prison release. We did that. New York would be the only one in the country to do that. And think about uh, providers going into jails and prisons and people leaving on Medicaid. Lenora. <clears throat> okay. Thanks, Harvey. Why does it matter? I don't even think I need to do the slide because I'm sure by now we're all on the same page. Everyone deserves a fair chance to live a healthy life. Just everyone. It's, it's so unfair when people don't have the when they don't have the opportunity. And I must say, I know both um, Department New York State Department of Health and New York State Department of Mental Health. They're both doing some work um, to help. There's there's the Social Terms of Health um, Department that was recently created, and I've done well, I've done work with both groups. And I know over at um, the Office of Mental Health is that a lot of work is being done in um, ensuring that cultural competence is woven into a lot of the standards and the work that they do. 
I, I must say, though, that that's not enough, and we need to be much more intentional and deliberate about the work. So it's not, uh, so folks on the end, like myself, who's going for care, can actually see the benefits of that work, and I can enjoy um, great outcomes that can be well. So it's time to refocus, reinforce, and receive the message that self charges exist. It's not it, it, it's not something that we make up. We have data supported. It it exists. Racial health disparities exist. It's a fact. It's nothing that we're having as you can hear and make it up. You all here, you see the you see the stuff. And we all we all in some way contribute to it. We all need to work diligently and deliberately to dismantle it so that those who we serve can enjoy um great outcomes. It's not enough to point the finger at it's the state, it's the this, it's the that. We all have a role that we can play in dismantling and making healthcare better for those who we serve. Um, I, I saw this Garfield um, cartoon thing, and it's all about we have to set goals. Um, nothing happens in and of itself if we don't have a goal if we don't have a direction. So we have to have very, very clear direction as to where we're going so we can figure out how do we get there. And if getting there means that we're going to address, significantly address and eliminate disparities, then we need to be very intentional about those goals. The goal should be to eliminate disparities. We need to figure out when it is eliminated, when has parity been reached, and when has health equity been achieved? And um, the Institute of Medicine, I stole this from them. It's um, the radical design in healthcare. Care better than we have ever seen. Health better than we have ever known. At a cost we can all afford for every person, every time. And that's it. I want to thank you all for joining, Louise. Do you want to say something towards the end? But thank you all for joining us. Uh, Go ahead. I, I, I am just um, so, so happy that we were able to share this amount of information with everyone. Thank you for joining. Once again, thank you to Lenore Reed Rose and to Harvey Rosenthal for just doing a phenomenal job today and opening this webinar series. Thank you so much. CEUs, please complete the evaluation that's going to um, be offered to you after the webinar. After the completion of the evaluation, you will get a one unit for your CEU. Thank you again. Thank you for your support. Thank you for uh, everyone who uh, helped out with uh, this presentation today and thank you uh, for people attending the presentation. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.